Welcome to the Real Estate Show. From buying to selling and everything in between, Rochester's home for everything real estate. And now, your hosts from the Anthony Butera team of Keller Williams Realty, Greater Rochester. It's Anthony Butera and Jason Mancuso. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 113 of the Real Estate Show. We have Anthony and Jason here. Hello. Hello. How are we doing? Doing good. Weather's actually nice for the day. Yeah. You know, I'm sure it'll be snowing tomorrow, but how was your Easter, Mark? It was it was good. Well, like we always had Easter at our house. Like we do like a brunch thing. Mm-hmm. Um and obviously last year it was not happening, you know. Oh yeah. Last year it wasn't even like like last year I think around Easter time it was like Oh, are we all dying? You know, we we yeah. hardly know anything about it. We just knew that uh-huh. Governor Cuomo was like shutting everything down. It's like we are all dying. But <laughs> um now, you know, I've got my first got my first hit of the vaccine. A lot of people in my yeah. family got their first and second hits of the vaccine, so we were able to have, you know, obviously a smaller get together, but had a bunch of people yeah. over and actually did stuff. Any side effects you want to speak of? Uh, I only so I got the Moderna. And I only I got the first one. I heard the side effects are more of the second one. Other than a sore arm, I didn't really get anything. Okay. Oh yeah, COVID shoulder. They call that COVID shoulder. Got that sweet COVID shoulder then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe the second one. Maybe I'll feel like uh, feel like crap after the second one. Who knows? I got. Um, I went there for a shot, and they gave me braces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I asked if I could be. I asked if I could be put sleep for the shot because I don't like shots. And I woke up with braces. On, <laughs> and um, but the good news is, my twelve-year-old nephew, he was supposed to get braces, and he just ended up getting a COVID shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mixed up the butera file. It happens. Anthony, yeah. is this your first time in in your life having braces? It is, and. Um, the day I got them two weeks ago, I thought I was going in just for a consultation. And um, I walk in and he says, hey, let's sit down. Let's talk. Take a seat right here. And I take a seat. And um, I thought it was awkward because it was a dental chair, right? And I was like, why do I got to be like laying down, right? Like, like, like this is a casting couch. I just want to talk about um, my mouth and my jaw. And um, he brings over a tray of goodies. And um, next thing you know, my mouth's getting wired up. So oh my God, <laughs> I have to, um, I got to wear braces for three months so they can shift the teeth to where they want them before my jaw surgery in August. And then the jaw surgery, I get five weeks of my mouth wired shut. Oh, that's like Kanye West style, man. Yes. What, what do you, what, what, ha- I, this is all news to me. I yes. Guess. So you're getting jaw surgery. Is this something that you've always had or did you get into a fight or, you know? No, no fight. Um, I, I've got a, an underbite that just is getting worse with old age. And then they kind of like painted the picture of me being an old person that looks like Beavis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, he's, he's like, well, you know, you ever see the old people with like the caved in chins? I was like, yeah. Well, do you want to look like that? Well, no. <laughs> Deal. I want to be Deal. hot when I'm old. I want to be hot. I want to make bank, bro. I want to drive a range. Yeah. <laughs> and then he says, you can do all that, but you got to get braces and jaw surgery and pay me $20,000. Oh, that and is. I said, <laughs> and I said, thank I you, Doc. Talk with the previous look. <laughs> I said, thank you. I don't have enough going against me. Thank you. So, who cares? Braces. So, so now I'll be Beavis when we're older. Oh yeah, you already are. Then you can be bad. But then I was thinking, well, like, what if I have enough chins when I'm older where you can't even see it? And I was like, God, take these braces off. <laughs> All I remember from when I had braces, they had to do this thing where it was like a bar that went across my upper jaw, and they had to, my mom had to like twist it to widen my jaw. She had to widen my jaw in order to spread out the teeth. So she had like this thing where every night she had to like twist inside of my mouth, turn it, and it would widen like some kind of medieval torture, you know? Where, who, who, where was your dentist? <laughs> Lollipop farm? Deep gates. <laughs> <laughs> my God, 
I love that they gave your mom the ability. <laughs> Who else is going to do it? I was like yeah. 12. Crank oh. this a few times a night, was it? God, yeah. Crank this a few God. times a night? I was doing yeah. that too. Don't bring your mom when you got kidney stones. <laughs> Imagine what her homework's going to be then. Oh boy. So what's this podcast about? Uh, appraisals, I'm, right? <laughs> real estate. Real estate. Real estate. <laughs> yeah, so let's let's talk about that. Jason just, you know, as we were scrambling before the show, he, he brought it up. Let's talk about appraisals. And it seems to be a, uh, a hot topic with the market that we're in right now, right? Where um, the average listings are selling well over list prices in most cases. And of course, the appraisal, right? I can sell something for any amount of money. And yet, if the buyers are obtaining financing, it's irrelevant what they're willing to pay from a bank's perspective of what they're willing to loan, right? So appraisals are done to protect the lender from allowing somebody to overborrow with the ultimate fear of, hey, if they move in and they default on this loan, we're gonna be stuck with it. So they gotta make sure they have enough uh, skin in the game and, uh, and very little risk, right? So that's where the appraisals come into play. And in this market, we're seeing appraisal issues. Yeah. And appraisal, now I would, like consumers and even some real estate agents, they always confuse a, appraisal and assessment. Appraisal is the amount the lender gives. The appraisal is considered the fair market value according to the lender. The assessment is the amount that you're being taxed on. And a lot of buyers today, you'll hear like, wait a second, how'd that house sell for $300,000? It's only assessed at one fifty-five. dollars And it's like, hey. Yeah. All I can tell you is eventually your assessment will catch up to your purchase price. Maybe this year, it may be in four years, but just expect it and appreciate your discount until then. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important to have that like initial discussion of what is an appraisal and and tying in the you know the different because that's that's common appraisals assessments that they get mixed up people get confused. So yeah, I mean it's it's a if it, if you're buying a home with all cash, this conversation is irrelevant because you don't have to go through an appraisal process. Um, now you want to if if you plan on buying cash and then refinancing later then it becomes relevant. Essentially the lender is not going to allow you to take out a, a loan. Um, if the appraisal doesn't meet that, that price. So it's, it's a super important aspect of the process for buying a home. Um, if you're using a bank, which, you know, whatever the numbers are probably, I don't know what, 95% of the, of the population goes that route. Right. Um, so, you know, this is usually not a conversation in a you know, balanced or not extreme market. And fast forward to today, where we're at, uh, you know, to, to recap everything that's been going on in the last three, four years, pricing is skyrocketing. And these appraisers, okay, so an appraiser does an appraisal, not a realtor, a real estate agent. So appraisers have to use actual data of what's being, you know, closed out in terms of sale. So they can't look at something as a pending sale and use that as a comparable for, you know, making the case that this house should appraise at this number. So we're looking at past data and in the market that we're in now, the data from today of what's going under contract is different than the data of what's selling from three year, three months ago, six months ago, a year ago, in that it's more. So the issue becomes the appraisers have to look at the actual closed data and it can be less than what you know, the buyer pool out there is determining what is quote unquote market value for what a home is selling for today. And then you run in a situation where, okay, the bank didn't, you know, appraise the, the property at the value that I'm purchasing it at. Now what? 
And, and I guess I'll, I'll throw in the caveat or the asterisk right now to, to tell everybody like, this conversation that we're about to have in terms of what is happening in the marketplace and what, you know, buyers are doing to, to make themselves competitive. I don't agree with it, but it's, it's more so like, like I'm like, we're acknowledging like, this is crazy. This is extreme. This, you know, you're going to listen to this to may think that we're totally off our rocker and unreasonable. But, you know, what we're going to dive into now is, like, what's happening in the market and, you know, what buyers are doing. What you're, If you're buying a home, what your competition is potentially doing to, quote, unquote, win an offer. And, you know, <laughs> what that means is buyers are essentially tasked with, coming up with more money to cover the difference between what they're under contract to purchase a house for and what it appraises for. And, you know, this isn't largely just a couple thousand dollars in most cases that we're talking about. I mean, we're talking 10, 20, 30, $40,000 um, at stake a lot of times because again, the, the market appreciation has in so rapidly just in the last year alone that these appraisers can't use the data to catch up with it because you know what's under contract now hasn't closed yet therefore they can't use it yeah every 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 house that's selling right now it's the it's the future comp the problem is right. there's no historical comps to support the purchase price right so in this market it's even more amplified around like not every offer is treated equally. And the assumption is in a multiple offer situation, the highest dollar amount is going to win. And I can tell you that probably 50% or more of the time we're accepting offers for less money with better terms from buyers that are willing to cover an appraisal gap. Now, Remember, not every buyer has the ability to do that. So if we get an FHA offer, we know that most likely they're using an FHA mortgage because they only have to put down 3.5%, right? Now, with a 20% down conventional mortgage, it's less risky if they're willing to cover an appraisal gap because they're already putting 20% down, right? So they already have 20% skin into the game. Um, but conventional appraisals, are done differently than FHA appraisals and VA appraisals are done differently than FHA and conventional. First are extremely difficult to get accepted because of the appraisal issues. Now VA to protect these government backed loans. Um, you got to remember these are hundred percent loans, meaning if these buyers never make a mortgage payment, 100% of the risk is on the lender, right? And they have no skin in the game. They have no protection. So VA appraisals are notorious for coming in substantially lower than what a purchase price would look like in this market. So we're almost like guiding buyers that they have no choice. They have to use VA or they have to use FHA. Um, we're, we're guiding them to like, listen, it's going to be tough for you to compete. We're not telling you not to look at that hot new listing, but you're probably going to be buying something that went on the market seven days ago. They did delayed negotiations and they never ended up selling. Like those are the properties you should be looking at because if we can avoid competition, that's the path of least resistance. Yeah. Good point. And yeah, you know, again, all of this sounds crazy, right? Like you, you could very well be a buyer or a consumer, whatever you want to call it, and say like, so you're telling me I got to pay more than what a house is worth based on the appraiser not, you know, agreeing with the value. How about having to tell? How about having to tell a veteran like, hey, listen, yeah. we appreciate you taking bullets for us and defending our country, and uh, because of that, we can't get an offer accepted. <laughs> I've said that before on this show, I think, but that, that, that aspect, irks, that's the number one thing that irks me the most about this business is 
is like, you know, <laughs> you, you rightfully want to take care of your VA loan status or yeah. you use your VA loan status. And essentially it's a, it's a punishment at this point. And, and a lot of these people, right? Like if they're active duty, like no one gets into the military for the money, right? So a lot of these people, they need that 100% financing and they deserve it. And we can't control the VA's appraisal process. It's a right. government entity. It's to their discretion. Yeah. So, you know, this is where the market has progressed to where we're having this conversation, right? Like we've been talking for years now, you know, like the initial topic was like, you got, you know, buyers are waiving inspections and that's, seems crazy now where we're at now it's i don't know anthony what would you say nine out of ten offers come in without an inspection oh yeah eight out, eight out of ten at least seven uh, yeah i can't the yeah. overwhelming majority like buyers just know they're not going to have a chance if they have an inspection contingency um the market's progressed to where you know general rule of thumb used to be one percent of the purchase price for a deposit now yeah. it's <laughs> as much as humanly possible to show the seller that you got skin in the game. Mm -hmm. um, you know, no other contingencies involved. And now we're at the point where it's like, okay, I'm a buyer and I need to think about contractually stating from the start, Hey, if this house doesn't appraise for what I'm willing to pay for it, I'll cover the difference with additional funds. Cause that's what we're seeing from the competition in terms of what, you know, what buyers are doing at this point. And again, it's like, I'm not saying it's right or it's fair or, you know, anything like that. Um, I'm, I'm removing emotion from it and just letting you know, this is what's happening. So this is what the competition is doing. And on the flip side of the coin, as a, as a listing agent representing a seller, our job is to protect the seller as much as possible. And if we have buyers or offers that are being presented with that clause attached to it, we can let the seller know like, yeah, in my opinion, this has no chance of appraising for $300,000. You know, when like last year's value was 250 or, you know, even less in some cases in that scenario, but it doesn't matter because the buyer stating contractually they they'll still buy it no matter what and they'll cover the difference so it's kind of as a listing agent working with a seller it's like okay here's your obvious choice this is as clean as it can get because yes we have a mortgage contingency but essentially we don't have an appraisal contingency attached to it where in a you know quote unquote normal market if the house doesn't appraise then everybody's got a problem you know most mostly the seller um now it's now it's okay. Buyers are willing to overcome that that um, that gap from from appraised price to purchase price. So I'm not saying it, may, it makes sense or should make sense, but this is uh, here's your here's your update of the market as of April eighth in 2021. This is where we're at right now. It's, it's pretty wild, and this is the national trend too. This isn't just you know. Rochester, New York, on the extreme end of things. This is uh, yeah. this is you know pretty much across the board. This trend, and if anything, like we're catching up because a lot of these bigger markets, there's a lot more cash thrown around anyway. You know, we're we're kind of you know we're not a luxury market um, where there's a you know whole slew of uh, billionaires around, right? So. Yeah, another another added like another added bump in the road, right? It's it's yeah. it's an issue. Um, we're gonna see more and more of it. There's really no signs right now of this market changing. I, I unfortunately I feel like it's going to be just as intense next year at this time. There's just there's and what's crazy is everybody thinks that it's truly a low inventory market and. The historical data will tell you that the same amount of units are being done now as there were five years ago or 10 years ago. The demand is that much higher, right? So we've never had this much demand. And it's confusing. It confuses me because I'm, I mean, at least once a week, I'm going on a listing appointment where the sellers are moving out of state. So it's like, wait a second, everybody's leaving New York. 
where, why is there like, where are these people coming from? Like our population, it shows our population, like in our area, it's been on a gradual decline and it's consumer confidence. It's, it's, um, you know, a record number of first time home buyers and it's just a different, it's just a different market. And like the agents, agents that got in the business the last few years, like they're, they're struggling because representing buyers is extremely difficult to get an offer accepted. And uh, an agent called me this morning and she was kind of just venting is like, I cannot wait for this market to turn around because this is just so frustrating. It's a, I have anxiety every day. I know that I got to write 10 offers to get one accepted. And I had to remind the agent, I had to remind the agent that um, when I got into the business nine years ago, couldn't give a house away. Um, and literally listings were on the market 60 to 90 days on average. And, and, and guess the frustrating calls you received every day, your seller. Hey, haven't heard anything. How's everything going? Oh, you haven't heard anything since yesterday? Well, there's no showing request. How do you think it's going? Right? <laughs> when was the sweet spot? When was it like, oh, this is perfect? Was it like when you months? When you bought. When yeah, you when bought. <laughs> yeah. Was that it? Yeah. That was the sweet spot. <laughs> um, I, I mean, you know, probably like I would say five years ago, it was like I would consider that a stable market. Yeah. The last few years, it's just, it's, it's gotten crazy. It's gotten wild. The economy, you know, the economy is doing good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Consumer confidence is high. Demand is high. The interest rates are low. It's the perfect storm to get where we're at right now. Yeah. And it's, and it's extreme storm. Um, and to your point about the inventory levels, like, yeah, the, the transactional amount is, you know, the same essentially year over year over year. And what's happening is like, usually there's homes left over that don't sell and carry over to uh, <laughs> not only a 10 to 20 day period, but like you said, 60 to 90 days. We don't have that supply. And it's just, as soon as a home is listed, it's sold within a week. Oh yeah. There's just not enough supply to meet the demand. Yeah. And, and at least like the buyers, right. I mean, and the, I, have to, I have to probably do a better job of relaying this to the agents. Like, Hey guys, listen, your buyers, if they don't get the offer, it's because they put their best foot forward and it just wasn't enough, right? In, an, in, a, in a buyer's market, an extreme buyer's market, um, those sellers are not, I mean, they look at it as it's not on us. You agreed to list that for this price and why isn't it selling? Guys, listen, I think that we need to do a price reduction and the pushback is, why would we do a price reduction? Like we should have another open house this weekend. That'll fix it. <laughs> right. So uh, to me, I think there's more frustration in the opposite market than there is right now. Um, but it's, that's my opinion. And in a certain level, like my job's really, my job's easy from the perspective of if you put it on the market, you know, it's going to sell. Like I, I'm not, I'm not um, taking a lot of frustrated seller calls these days. It's it's frustrated buyers and frustrated agents on our team and agents in our brokerage calls. That's kind of where everything shifted. But it's also not easy from the seller perspective because or listing perspective because you've got you know <laughs> at minimum on a low end ten offers for every one list. It's a lot oh, yeah. to get through, and we got to protect the sellers. We got to make like our attention to detail has to be there to, you know, go through a successful transaction, make sure that they're, you know, for our sellers, they're getting the best deal that they should get. And on the buyer end, like, you know, this conversation has progressed to where it's like, Hey, look at, I'm not re telling you or even recommending that you do this, this, and this, but here's what your competition is doing. If there's, you know, on a low end, 10 offers coming in on the property you want to buy, um, here's what six, seven, or eight of them are going to look like. Big num on top of the, being a big number to purchase. Big deposit, no inspection, and now this appraisal, you know, gap conversation. That's where it's escalated to, where it's like, 
it's just so extreme. It's one thing to think like waiving an inspection is extreme. Now you're saying I'll pay more than what, you know, an appraiser that dictates market value is, you know, telling me the house is worth. Yep. And that's happening with buyers. Like this is, we're not making this up and like trying to, you know, coerce the market <laughs> into doing this. This is like, this is what we're seeing. We need to relay this to people so they're informed. So you don't, you know, you, you know what you're going into. And again, it's not like this is what you need to be doing or what you should be doing. This is what the competition's doing. So, you know, you, you tell us what you're comfortable with and how competitive you want to be. It is very interesting. Um, I have two, two people in my life. Like I have my, uh, my younger brother and I have my brother-in-law that are both, they, they never owned a home first home, but first time home buyers. And, um, they are way, way, way more prepared than I was. When I, like, I was way younger. I was probably like five years younger than they are when I first bought my, my home, my, my first house. And they are way overqualified and overprepared and have a ton of money in the bank and they're struggling. You know, <laughs> like, and I would, for me, it was like, I had no, there, there should have been no reason I was buying a home. And I was like, oh, <laughs> let's see if I can do this. Mark, I remember you specifically saying that um, we can't rent anymore. Our apartment is a shithole, and we had a mushroom growing in our shower. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I lived it. I was there. I was <laughs> definitely there. Yeah, we needed pl- we needed a place to put the goats. So you know? <laughs> can't be living in a row house in the city with goats. <laughs> Oh, you could. <laughs> yeah, you could try. You, you could. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, um. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say that's the latest. All right. Um. Anthemeteriotim dot com. Got the real estate uh, podcast there. You can subscribe and uh, YouTube, Facebook, all that good stuff. Apple Podcasts. All right, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening to The Real Estate Show. Find us on Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. If you're looking to sell or buy, talk to the Anthony Butera team of Keller Williams Realty, Greater Rochester. Visit anthonybuterateam.com.